And today I'll be talking about great words in Genesis, the book of Genesis. And you might know this, that the word, word in Hebrew, davar, means matters. So when I say I'm going to talk about the five great words, or not the, but eight, five great words in Genesis in the opening of the first three Torah readings, uh, you could also say the five great matters, as almost uh, many of you know, I'm sure. Uh, when we talk about the Ten Commandments, that's an old English translation that goes back to the 1500s. And they put words, uh, uh, it actually says words rather, and they put commandments. There are a few translations that put words. So the Ten Words are the Ten Matters. We've talked about that a lot in our circles. So when I talk about five great words here, it's five great matters or things or subjects or concepts. That's what I want to deal with. The first one here in Hebrew, this I give you the Hebrew. If you can't read Hebrew, you've got the transliteration, nefesh kaya. Okay. Genesis 1.20 is where it first occurs. I'm interested really in the word nefesh, but you nefesh kaya means a living nefesh. There's such a thing as a dead nephish. So that should tell you what a nephish is as we go further into it. It can either be living or dead. But if it's living, it's nephish kaya. Kai, kaya. Genesis 1.20, And God said that the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the firmament of heaven. I picked the RSV because that's just the standard normal translation going back in many cases to the American Standard and the King James. And it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it, really, except when I say bring forth when you can say swarm a swarm, I think that's a lot better. But here's our word here. I put the key words in blue. A living life breather. So a nephesh is a life breather. It actually refers to the neck where you breathe. And fish also are nephesh because they breathe through the gills. They're living life breathers. All creatures on the earth are living life breathers. So here we have my translation. And Elohim said, let the water swarm a swarm of living life breathers and let the flyer fly upon the land, upon the face of the expanse of the skies. There's a lot in these translated verses we're going to cover that I could comment on, but I'm going to skip that or try to restrain myself here and just focus on the key words. So this right here, a living life breather, is nefesh kaya. And literally, I translate it, it's living and it's a life breather. So as I said, you can have a dead nefesh. If an animal is killed or a human is killed, that body is still a life breather, but it doesn't have life and it's not breathing. We talk about the breath of life departing and somebody breathing their last breath and then they're dead. So nefesh is basically a breathing creature. And here it's talking about fish. Verse 24, and let the land make a living life breather go out. I'm being very literal here. It, it literally says, let the land put forth or let it go out of the land uh, as it emerges literally from the land. And then 2.7, and this is the big point that gets so misunderstood. And Jehovah Elohim, we'll talk about those words later, shaped the soil creature. That's the word for the human. He's, he's made of soil, Adam, Adama, dust from the soil, and he blew into his nostrils breath of life. Hold that one for a minute. And the soil creature became a living life breather. So humans, land animals, and fish, and birds are all living life breathers. Same word in Hebrew. And it's very important as we go on, we're going to do the next one, which is the breath of life. Let me go forward. This nishmat from nasham to pant or to puff, it's very, very similar. 
if nephesh is a life breather, in other words, I point at an animal, a fish, a human, and say, you're this thing that breathes life or air, then now you have the Lord God, that's actually the divine name, Yahweh or Jehovah, Jehovah God form man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. That's the RSV. Living being is not bad, but the King James used to say living soul. And it was the only time soul occurred in this chapter and boy, did that lead people astray and still is leading people astray because they think, well, humans have the breath of life and so they're living souls. They have an immortal soul. And those animals, those poor animals, they just breathe air. What I want you to see is this term nishmat is, is the word breath. It's the thing the nefesh breathes. So it's literally just breath. Here's my translation in the TEV. And Jehovah Elohim shaped the soil creature. It's not create. It's literally like uh, in clay. You shape it. Dust from the soil. And he blew into his nostrils nishmat kaim. It's actually plural. Often you talk about life as lives. It's a way of emphasizing it, just like El and Elohim, which we'll get to in a minute. And the soul creature became a living life breather. Now that's that word nefesh kaya. So I know I'm just kind of speaking Hebrew here, but there's two words. There's nefesh kaya, a living breather. And then there's the nishmat kaim, the breath of life that you put into the living breather so that one is a living breather. Without this breath of life, the soul creature would not be a living life breather. He would be a potential life breather. So that step one is make the nefesh, in this case a human being, and step two is breathe into his nostrils the nishma chaim, the breath of life. Notice here in Job 27.3, I'm just going down the line. I don't have a cursor on this screen, but you can just follow me by looking. Uh, Job says, as long as my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Now here, spirit can't, you know, ruach can mean wind. And it's used for wind all the time. If you're talking about a wind storm or wind blowing, it's ruach. And spirit, you know, the word spirit, especially when you put a capital S on it and talk about the spirit of God, it's taken as this entity, really, that is separate from the wind. But it's really an attempt to describe the invisible force, you might say. But here you see a very literal use that's just like Genesis. In other words, this is not what people call the Holy Spirit in your nose, in your nostrils. It's exactly here. God breathes this nishmat kaya into Adam's nostrils. And then he becomes a living breather. And here Job is saying, as long as i am got the breath and the spirit, which is this, it's Hebrew parallelism, the breath in me, the spirit of God in my nostrils. You see the idea, it's the same thing. Now, when the flood comes, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life, that's the RSV. Now, notice this, it's interesting because in the Hebrew, this is my translation, everything in whose two nostrils, very literal, two nostrils, was the breath of a spirit of life. Very similar to this text in Job. Breath, spirit. Breath of a spirit of life. So the breath comes in, and this is everything who breathe, every living creature that breathes. And this is all the creatures. And only, according to Genesis, only eight were humans who were saved in the ark, right? And then here you have the animals coming toward Noah and one of the sources for the flood toward the vessel two by two from all flesh in which is a spirit of life. So there you have the same thing, the nishmat kaim, the spirit of life or the breath of life. You see how it's being used in a double way. 
Here's some other texts uh, that tell what happens if you lose that spirit of life. Uh, God tells uh, Adam, in the sweat of your nostrils, you will eat bread until you return to the soil from what from it you were taken. For dust you are, and toward dust you will return. So that's an exact reverse of Genesis 2-7. Look up above. You shape the soil creature into a nefesh kaya, a living breather. Breathe into its nostrils the breath of life. It becomes a breathing, living life breather. And here, you return to the soil because your dust and spirit leaves. Here's a better description of the leaving of the spirit. This doesn't mention that. This is more the body. When his breath departs, he returns to his earth. There you go. And on that very day, his thoughts perish. And the word thoughts is, is plans, activities, literally like doings. His doings perish. He's taken out. He's uh, When you die, you're out of commission, so to speak. This is so opposite from the Greek view that develops in the Hellenistic world that the body is nothing. And what really counts is an immortal soul that's imprisoned within the body. It's the real life. And if it could get out, then the soul could live forever and has this inherent immortality. Some of you studied this before, but I think it's the most common idea that I can think of uh, that people hold that somehow uh, basically the breath of life or the uh, living soul is, is an entity when it's actually a process. You understand? If you're living, you're breathing, you're alert, you're doing things. If you're dead, you go back to the dust, your breath departs, your spirit departs, and you're dead. And your plans or your doings stop. They perish. Whenever people die suddenly, you know, that's the first thing you think of. What they could have done, and that perishes. Ecclesiastes 3.19 shows that there is a transition going on where some people are saying, well, maybe the spirit of humans is different than the spirit of animals. And the writer, this, this is called Kohelet in Hebrew, he says the fate of the sons of men, human beings, and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. That is the Genesis 1 and 2 story, as we see in the text. So this great word, nishmat kaya, is this breath of life that we receive at our birth when a newborn baby takes that first breath of life and begins to be then a breathing nephesh. Doesn't mean they're dead before that because we know it's basically oxygen that's supplied by the mother. But once you're independent of the mother and of the umbilical cord, uh, you will die very quickly unless you then take in the breath of life. We all know that. They all have the same breath. In humans or man has no advantage over the beast, all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and turn to dust again. So where do people go when they die? They go back to the dust. Then notice this, I put it on italics. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes downward? Because what's being suggested here, and this is very, very late, as the Hellenistic world is beginning to impact and influence uh, the ancient Near Eastern world, that, well, maybe humans, their spirit is an immortal soul, and it probably goes up, and the spirit of beasts goes down because they're not that uh, important. This I just put in because I love the phrase that's used twice in Numbers, that El is the God, the El of the spirits of all flesh, and that would be the breath of all flesh. So that's our second word. So nefesh kaya, nishmat kayim, the breath of life. Let's go to the next one. Now this one we're very familiar with, and here's a combination of several. You've got Elohim that comes from El. 
So here's the famous verse, Genesis 1-1, in my transparent translation. At the first of Elohim creating the skies and the land, the land was desolation and emptiness, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit, that's literally the ruach, the wind of Elohim, was hovering over the face of the waters. So you had this wind sweeping over the waters. And Elohim said, let there be light. And there was light. Vayahi or, kind of like, let there be light, like that. Now, there are other terms, but El, I think most of you are familiar with. Elohim is the plural. I usually tell my students it's something like saying the force, El is force or power, the force of all forces, it's plural. The, some people call it the plural of majesty. In other words, it's all force. And we're going to get to naming the force in a minute. So humans are living breathers with the breath of life in them. And El, or Elohim, is the force of all forces. Seems to be self-generated, so to speak. And Genesis 1-1, I pointed this out before, it's not really about the words here, but it's not about the, when there was nothing, something was brought into being. But it's about the force of all forces beginning to work with the land and the skies on this planet. And it really isn't about the creation of the universe. I know that uh, surprises people, but it's very clear. It doesn't mention, uh, it does mention the stars and so forth uh, that would be visible to us, particularly the galaxies. But it, the whole focus is on, on the Earth itself. I said the galaxies, particularly in our solar system. Uh, but to ancient people, they would look up and see the planetary spheres and they would see the sun and the moon and they were all seen to be these forces. But this is the force of all forces. Then there is El Elyon, which is the force most high. It's another way of saying the force of all forces. What's really interesting about the force of all forces is that it's plural, but it takes a singular verb. So when it says, at the first of the force of all forces, creating the skies and the land, it's a singular verb. We say God created, Elohim created. So it's plural, but you use a singular verb. So that means it's this composite force of all forces. El Elyon is the same idea. I love this uh, section of Genesis where Melchizedek, an ancient priest, of the Most High God, El Elyon. Literally, El God, Elyon, the highest God. Like there can be a lot of forces, all the way down to humans are called Elohim, judges. But they're not the Most High El. So this is the Most High El, or El Elyon, King of Salem. He takes bread and wine. He was a priest to El Elyon. This is not the name. Yahweh or Jehovah. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram to El Elyon, to the Most High God, the one possessing skies and land, Genesis 1 again. If he orders and creates the skies and the land, and of desolation and emptiness brings order and form and pulsating life on this beautiful planet which we inhabit, then clearly he is the possessor. It's actually the word kone, which means to possess, to buy, to own. Uh, in modern Hebrew prayers, you say Baruch Atah, Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, King of the Universe, the idea of uh, being king, ruling. This is more direct, possessing everything. And blessed be El Elyon, who's enclosed your oppressors in the land. If you look up that story in Genesis 14, the people on the tour got it firsthand because Abraham goes all the way up to Dan in the far north and we saw the gates. They call them the gates of Abraham just because it's mentioned that he goes up there. But they're the gates from the Canaanite period that are dating from that period. So this idea of El Elyon and then you have El Shaddai. El Shaddai uh, Genesis 17, 1 is the way God introduces himself to Abraham. He says, I am El, force, 
Shaddai. So what is Shaddai? It's basically, uh, the word Shad is, it's a plural, but it either means a breast or nipple to succor or comfort. And it also can mean to destroy or to protect. It's a very interesting Hebrew word. So it, depending on the context, and I, I love the idea that it might even be combined here. El Shaddai would be God, the protector and the nurturer, either nursing or being comforted and also guarded. And this is the name that occurs throughout uh, Job and another of the older texts of the Hebrew Bible. Let's see, I put uh, Psalm 42 and 83 are called the Elohim Psalms. Why are they called the Elohim Psalms? Because they generally don't use the what we refer to often as the yod heh vav heh the divine name. They tend to use Elohim. You should read them. They're very interesting. In other words, you go from 42, which is book two of the Psalms, all the way up to 83. And it's almost Elohim, all Elohim, Elohim, Elohim. Many of you know Psalm 51 by heart. Notice it says, have mercy on me. O oh, Elohim, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. That's this psalm that David wrote after his adultery with Bathsheba and essentially murdering or arrange, arranging for Uriah to be killed. And he refers to Elohim. It's the older primitive form of the force of all forces. But these psalms are very interesting because I'm not saying they never use yod heh vav here. Sometimes they do, but primarily they use Elohim. I think we don't tend to think of Elohim as a name, but more as a description like, oh, that's God, but what is his name? But actually, these are names as well. Think of name as designation, descriptive designations and you're trying to describe the ultimate force of the universe from an ancient ter Near Eastern perspective, which is somewhat limited, looking up at the skies, looking up at the stars and the planets and the moon and the sun and so forth, and then saying, how is all of this ordered? How is all of this uh, arranged and what's it all about and so forth? And the answer would be, well, the force of all forces. Now, what the next slide is about, uh, so now we've got the name of God, Elohim, El, Elohim, Aloha. Here's the one where people get confused. yod heh vav -Heh, the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God. There is in the Jewish prayer book uh, a hymn. Here's my Jewish prayer book. It's called Adon Alam, but it, what it says is, uh, Hu Yehie, Hu Hove, Hu Haya. He will be, he is, he was. Those sounds, literally, yihye, hove, haya, those actual verbs in Hebrew are forms of the verb to be. So yod, he, vav, he, my understanding of it, this phrase that is given in, in Exodus 3 when Moses says, okay, you're a force of all forces, but what do I call you? And what I want to point out here, because I think uh, too many people think of this as a mantra or a set of syllables, like you need to get the name right. Well, what you need to get is the concept right, because the concept, if you say, what is God's name? And I say, I will be what I will be. I say, well, that's not a name. Yes, it is. What he says in uh, Exodus here is literally... Uh, I will be what I will be. The King James even puts I am, which is kind of interesting. The Hebrew is in the imperfect. So probably in English, I will be what I will be is better. But I am, you know, if you always were and you always will be and you are now, you could just say pure being. That's what a philosopher would say. What names do is they designate objects, right? So obviously, to be simple, a book, a piece of paper. So you say, what is that? It's paper. Well, what is Elohim of Elohim, the force of all forces? Name it. Name the force of all forces. You can't name it. In other words, what I'm saying is yod heh vav -Heh is not a name. It's a description 
that is essentially saying it can't be named, meaning it can't be limited. I'll just say Yehovah because in Hebrew that's the sound of it. Yet he will be Ho Hove. He is and Haya Va. So Yehovah. As long as you understand that that's what it is, and not just a magic name that if you say it right, Yehovah. As, uh, sometimes people say, "Well, you said Jehovah, and there's no J in Hebrew." Well, I'm speaking English. You know, there is a J in English, and I'm. If I say Jacob, you say, "Well, you can't say Jacob. You got to go Yaakov." Well, if I'm speaking Hebrew, I'll say Yaakov. But if I'm speaking English, I'll say Jacob, or I might even say my own name, James, which is Jacob in English. You see, so it's not a magical formula. It's not a mantra. As some people think that you got to just pronounce it a certain way. People even disagree on how to pronounce it. But the meaning seems clear. Even scholars and the majority of scholars would say Yahweh. Yahweh is probably the best translation. That's also the third person imperfect of the verb to be. It's like saying he will be. And it's picking up on I will be what I will be. So whether you say Yahweh or Yehovah or Jehovah, you're in a sense you're naming. Here he says, "What is your name?" But he says, "This is my name, and thus I am to be remembered." But remembered is this word zikron, which means my memorial or my way of describing myself. That is, if you want to think of the force of all forces, what is the force of all forces? The thing that will be. And uh, is and was.、Um, so here is my translation: I will be what I will be. That's really the name. In other words, that's not different from Yod Hey Vav Hey. It's an explanation. Ehiye Asher Ehiye. I will be what I will be. I am. I will be. I am, and so forth. And many of you know this, but some people don't. And they talk about the sacred name and what is the sacred name? How about the sacred concept?、Uh, remember that words are matters or concept concepts. Okay. Now here I'm using two words,、uh, zedekah and mishpat, and I'm kind of counting as one concept. In the verse, I give it in the R here, and here I'm giving it in my translation. So let me just skip to the chase and use mine because using L O R D all caps is not really the best, I think, for clarity. And will is was or the force of all forces that we can't name and call pure being. Okay, you get my drift. Said, will I cover from Abraham? We say hide. I love the literalness. You know, I'm going to cover this. Said,、so、what are you doing? I'm covering it. I'm not telling. Will I cover from Abraham what I'm doing? For Abraham will be surely he'll be. I love the Hebrew where it repeats it.、Uh, I think the English just says, "Seeing that Abraham will become." That doesn't give you the feeling. I want an exclamation mark. For Abraham will be surely he will be. For a nation large and strong, and all the nations of the land will be blessed. So Abraham is called a goy, and the goyim. You know, people today say Goyim and Israel. There's a difference there, but Abraham's、uh, household is also a nation or a Goy, blessing the Goyim, meaning all the other nations or tribes. Or now, notice here, I have known him. Rs. V says I've chosen him. You know, I'm not emphasizing that now, but I want you to see the literal meaning. I have known him. So that he may charge his sons or children, really is the meaning, and his house after him. So this can also be the household. Remember, he circumcises three hundred and fifteen of his servants. They're also part of this larger nation to guard the way of will as was pure being, the Elohim of Elohim. You, you know, I'm piling these up together. By doing justness and judgment, so zedekah and mishpat—they almost sound the same when you say righteousness, right judgment, judgment. Something's right. Zedekah is even used for alms today, but really the idea I think is that 
justness is more your behavior. Like when we say do the right thing, was that the right thing to do? Was that tzedakah? Well, look at the world today. Look at all the nations, even look at Abraham's nation. A nation of Israel spread throughout the world, too many to count, scattered and lost and, and so forth, as well as the people we would recognize as the Jewish people. Is the behavior of everybody right and correct? You go to the 10 words and you get a breakdown of right behavior. Property rights, sexual purity, uh, taking things that aren't yours, uh, taking life and so forth and so on. Uh, but here, that would be justness, it's not a cow. Mishpat is usually used for judges making the right choice or decision. When you think about somebody else, what sort of judgment do you place upon them? Everybody knows the famous words of Jesus of Nazareth, who said, don't do mishpat in a way that doesn't recognize that you also will have mishpat done to you. The sort of rule of uh, reciprocation working there. Um, and so this is part of mishpat. It's found in various Jewish sources as well. So the idea would be that the entire world would be filled someday with mishpat and zedekah, people doing the right thing and people judging and behaving the right way towards others.